So everyone, hello and welcome. Please introduce yourself in the chat and I guess let us know where you're joining us from. Very interesting to see the demographic makeup here. So today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on eCampus Ontario's YouTube channel, just so you're aware. You can use the Q&A box to ask any questions and they will be answered during the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Yes, the chat is dis disabled, so everyone's aware. Uh, and live translation to French is available by clicking the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. All righty. All right, let's get started here. So once again, thank you everyone for joining uh, TESS's virtual week, I guess leading up to TESS. And a link to the slides is now being posted to the meeting chat. And I'm trying to transition slides here. Perfect. Let's begin with a land acknowledgement. So I want to begin by honoring and acknowledging the office of eCampus Ontario, which is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, which is, in Toronto is also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. And I want to recognize that I'm grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of First Peoples of this land. And in this virtual space, we are all convening or convening from different places. And this is one of the things that makes the online environment special. So I invite you all to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. Well, I want to officially welcome everyone to eCampus Ontario's virtual test week. My name is Chris Fernland, and I am a program manager at eCampus Ontario, supporting the Experience Design Lab and EdTech Sandbox. The, the Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase, or TESS as we know it, has been eCampus Ontario's annual flagship event since 2015. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, TESS really brings together the post-secondary community to share, learn, and celebrate as we shape the future of learning together as a province. And this year's theme, the hybrid experience designing the future of learning, really explores the evolution of an integrated digital and in-person education environment. We're also exploring the future of delivering vibrant learning experiences and really the steps we need to take today for a more effective and sustainable tomorrow. This year, we have three different tracks, imagining digital futures, digital inclusion, and practices and pedagogies. But today's webinar is about entangled pedagogy and hybrid design. And it gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce you to our guest speaker. And joining us today from Scotland is Dr. Tim Fawns. Tim is a senior lecturer in clinical education at the University of Edinburgh. He's also the co-director of the online MSc Clinical Education, also the director of the International Edinburgh Summer School in Clinical Education, and also runs a course in post-digital society for the Edinburgh Futures Institute. His main academic interests are in teaching and learning, mostly in healthcare and professional education, but often with a strong focus on technology and online, hybrid and blended modalities. He also researches autobiographical memory in relation to technology and media, mostly photography. And before his current role, he was learning, he was a learning technologist and a graphic and web designer before that. And today, Dr. Tim Fons is here to talk about the, an entangled pedagogy framework and how it can clear a path for educators as they move into a hybrid learning environment. Without further ado, I would like to welcome or please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Fonts. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, if somebody can just shout out it when they can see it, that'd be great. We can see your screen. I will share. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a real thrill and an honor. Um, and I, as Chris said, I'm joining from Edinburgh. Uh, you can see outside the window that it's already dark, even though it's only just hit 5 p.m. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's maybe one of the reasons why I am soon going to move across to Australia. Um, so all the lovely things that Chris said about what I do, uh, it's, I, there's a tinge of sadness there because I won't be doing some of them for very long. Um, so you can forget everything you've just learned about me um, because it's all going to change. Uh, I'm doing this 
online, obviously. And what that means is if I'm doing a, a talk online at about 5 p.m. At, from my house, it's almost certain that at least one of my children is going to make an appearance at some point and ask something about like, where's, I don't know, where's my laptop charger or something. Um, and that will give me a delightful opportunity to um, to demonstrate one of the key points that I want to make today anyway, which is that teaching is never perfect and conditions are never perfect and it's all a bit of a mess and we do our best. But it also gives an opportunity to talk about how the te teaching isn't really just done by a teacher. It's done by a lot of people in collaboration and all those people matter in different ways. And if we think about these kinds of practices as um, being, being born out of a distributed expertise rather than just one person's expertise, then that opens up a lot of ways of thinking about what are the implications for um, development of professionalism, what are the implications for design and the systems underpinning that and, and that sort of thing. But anyway, I will get to all of that. What I first want to do is just go into a few acknowledgements. Um, so I'll leave this long list of people up on the screen. Actually, there are more people, but uh, Jill Aitken and Derek Jones, my close colleagues from clinical education at the University of Edinburgh, I, uh, I have had hundreds of walks and talks with them around the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, the hospital, um, just chatting through all of these ideas. And so a lot of what I say comes out of their thinking. Uh, collaborators like Lena marcus to Lucilla Carvalho and Peter Goodyear, who um, who have informed my thinking through some of their own work and some of the conversations that we've had and some of the work we've done. Uh, Maha Bali, um, Anne-Marie Scott, John Dron, who you know have have engaged in quite deep conversations about this idea of entangled pedagogy. And then a whole list of other people from the Twitter community who helped me develop and refine one of the diagrams that I'm going to show you, which I made an open educational resource. Now. I think it's important to acknowledge all of these people's contributions and the idea that this isn't really just me, even though I'm talking right now, it's actually a lot of people who've contributed to this. And one of the th reasons why I think that's important is because I want us to get past the idea of individualism, that the teacher is the one who matters and that actually there are not that, that all these other people in the background, the administrators, the learning technologists, instructional de designers, IT support, the manage the managers and the line managers and the, the leaders and the policy makers, that they are somehow invisible in the work of design and educational practice. And um, when we make them invisible, we then make them inaccessible to um, some of the ideas I want to talk about. So partly I want to acknowledge the work of these good people and partly I want to make a point that we're never doing any of this stuff by ourselves. I think when we're talking about hybrid design in particular but actually any educational design and any educational um, approach this is a crucial concept that teaching is in large part a design activity and that can that's that's true even if we're talking about a lecture where i for example i'm talking to you um, for a great period of time there's design that has gone on in advance i've thought about hopefully i've thought about um what do i want the learners to do what do i want the social configuration to be what do i want the material configuration to be in the technological configuration maybe i have some agency over that maybe i have less agency but all of the thing, all of the um, preconceived considerations that go into this educational practice can be thought of as design, and therefore we have some sort of agency to do something about that. One of the issues, though, is that students must reinterpret our designs, and they often do that in ways that we don't really intend for them to do. So they subvert uh, intentionally and unintentionally our designs. And they um, they do so in ways that suit them or sometimes in ways that don't suit them. And that's why teaching is also orchestration. So you have a design in advance, then you have students subverting and reinterpreting those designs. And then you have the process of orchestration where you can come in as an educator and try to 
realign them to your expectations, the sorts of things that you think are important. And a really important aspect of that can be done through the articulation of the rationale for your design. Why have you designed the tasks this way? Why have you set up the social configurations this way? Why have you set up the material and technological configurations the way that you have and how is that all leading to some sort of purpose and if they the students the learners can understand where you're coming from and why they should engage in the way that you're asking them to do then it's much easier for them to complete your designs the, these are sorry i've just um unfull screened these are um, ideas that come particularly from Peter Goodyear's work um, and the importance of helping students to complete your designs. And as I go on in the second part of the talk, it'll become a bit more clear what that involves, hopefully. I'm just, I just wanna have a look to see if there's anything important in the chat. Um, well, yes, there is, but I won't need to address it just yet. Uh, so, where to design, where to start with design? Should we start with technology? Should we start with pedagogy? And these are conversations that I find we're having frequently in higher education at the moment. Um, and I think that this question is applicable to hybrid design, online design, on campus, blended learning, and all of these different modalities, or what I call modalities. Well, I don't think that we can start with technology. I, I don't think technology can be first. So even if you have a uh, virtual learning environment, a learning management system, new video conferencing software, some kind of technological system that everyone is uh, rooted through has to engage with, I still don't think you can say that technology is the first consideration of design for the simple reason that pedagogy is always already there. So we always have these um, histories of practice, these traditions, these cultures, policies, systems, ways of doing things, student and teacher expectations in place. And so you can't actually bring in a new technology and steamroller over all of that contextual stuff. It has to be integrated and embedded into what's already there. In response to um, the threat of technological solutionism, of, of people bringing in a technology to try and solve an educational problem, we often hear people say, needs to be technology first, or technology should drive technology, uh, pedagogy should drive, I think I, hang on. It, what they often say is it needs to be pedagogy first, and that pedagogy should drive technology. Um, I don't think that's possible either, because there's always technology already there. Um, and I think of technology quite expansively. I think of pens and papers and desks and chairs and rooms as technology. But even if you don't, there are still always technologies. There are always digital technologies always already there these days. So you can't say I'm going to start from a blank slate because you already have computers, you have Microsoft Word, you have virtual learning environments, you have email, you have social media, everything is already there. Um, someone's raised their hand. Do we, what do we do about that? Do we pause and find out what Sonia wants to ask? So I can't actually see people's raised hands, but if anyone has a question they would like to ask, like please use the Q&A feature. You can also use the chat, but I recommend the Q&A because that will come to uh, you. Sonia, Sonia says it was the wrong hand. So sorry to, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> sorry to put the spotlight good on reminder. you, Sonia. Um, but yeah, a good reminder that if you do have a question, then please use the Q&A. Um, and I <laughs> didn't mean to embarrass you, Sonia. Um, it could have been important. If anyone needs to use the bathroom, just go. Um, so the other thing about pedagogy not being first is that nobody really knows what pedagogy means. I mean, that's not true. Some people do. But I think there isn't a, an e easy, clear consensus as to the definition of pedagogy. So when you say pedagogy first, what, what do you mean? I think it's important to think about that. Um, and I wonder that whether sometimes when we say pedagogy first, and I, I should stress, this is something I'm quite sympathetic to. I don't like the idea of a technology coming in and being the, the thing that shapes what we do. So I'm, I'm sympathetic, but I just don't think it works to try and put te technology into the background 
and pedagogy into the foreground because I think technology is always implicated in pedagogy. But I also wonder when we say pedagogy first, are we shutting down possibilities that might be there for us in front of us? And are we trying to hold on to our old methods in new contexts? So for example, you might say during uh, lock COVID lockdowns, um, pedagogy should drive technology. So we shouldn't just get railroaded into using Zoom, for example, or into to using some system. Uh, but but is it that you actually are trying to hold on to your old practices, even if they don't fit easily into a new context? So I, I guess interrogating what we mean by pedagogy is an important step in thinking about how can we design so that technology doesn't get in the way too much, but that we are also open to possibilities of what we could achieve by making use of the resources, materials and technologies that are available to us. And also, I think we need to engage with technology in order to understand the risks of bene and benefits of the technologies that we might use, including the ones that are already there, but we've stopped noticing because they're so familiar to us. So this is just to reinforce, I don't think technology can be first or last, and I don't think pedagogy can be first or last. So I don't think it's the pedagogical horse driving the technological cart. I think that they are always caught up in a dance. There's, they're, they're always kind of tangled up in each other and, and moving um, reciprocally. So I guess I don't mind where you start with your design, but I think you always need to keep revisiting all of the different factors. And what I've done is I've, I've carved it into these five different factors purposes what are what are you trying to achieve and this isn't just the teacher but it's also considering the purposes of the students and there are multiple purposes for students and there are multiple purposes for teachers and there are purposes for policy makers administrators institutional bodies um, instructional designers there are a lot of different purposes going on there are also a lot of different values going on. What, what matters to us here? What do we think is important? Is it important to be open, inclusive, flexible, efficient? Um, so thinking about not just what are we trying to achieve, but what matters to us is really important. Thinking about the context, who are our learners? What level are they at? What discipline are they in? what's going on for them in the background, what's the economic climate like, what's the employment climate like, what's the institutional climate like, what are the traditions and cultures that they're coming from. Um, bearing all of those in mind. And then we have methods. We e Educators always have, and by educators, I'm trying to be quite expansive. So teachers and instructional designers, learning technology, all the teaching assistants, all of the people who are involved in education. They have repertoires of methods that they can draw on. So try to look past the default method and think, what are, the, what are all the options in front of me? And the technologies, what, what are the technologies that I've stopped noticing? What are the new technologies that I could bring in? What are the technologies that students are already using outside of um, my view? And I've said hold purposes, values, and context tightly and hold methods and technologies loosely. And by that, I don't mean that uh, any of these factors is more important than the other. I think they're all sort of equally important. And, and in fact, I don't like separating them out too much i think they're always entangled so actually thinking of them as differently important is unhelpful i just think that methods and technologies are often more visible and obvious and that's why it's important to look very closely at the purposes values and context just because they're harder to spot harder to notice and easier to forget and what I want to say is that all of this together, for me, is what I think of as pedagogy. Pedagogy is this kind of combined theory and practice of education that involves the, an emergent entanglement of all of those different factors. So to um, go into this a little bit more, and then I'll come back out of this heavy theoretical bit, don't worry. Um, but this is the diagram that I mentioned before that we refined via the Twitter community and through an open educational resource. 
to try and and then I eventually published a paper on it called Entangled Pedagogy something about looking past the pedagogy technology dichotomy um so what I tried to do was characterize some aspects of different views of the relationship between technology and pedagogy. The first one being the view that technology can drive pedagogy, which I've called te technological determinism. So technology here is the driver of social change. And the view of it of technology can be essentialist in which it embodies pedagogical principles such as inclusivity or efficiency or something like that. And, or it can be that there is an instrumental view of technology where technology is seen as a neutral tool, but it's a neutral tool that drives the efficiency of or the effectiveness of education. Um, so actually, there can be these hidden values of efficiency or effectiveness. Um, in this view, the teacher doesn't have much agency. It's really about the tools predicting outcomes and the skill involved is choosing the right tools and then correctly using them so actually there isn't that much knowledge um, or or agency involved in the educational practitioner because they just got to get the tools right the second column is about pedagogy driving technology which i've called pedagogical determinism where the educators are the drivers of change and that's an instrumental view of technology where we just use these neutral tools to achieve our ends. The teachers or the educators have a lot of agency here and they, their skills and the methods that they use predict the outcomes and the skill involves choosing the methods and using tools to achieve those methods. I've called both of those two columns illusions because I think that while you might, um, you might subscribe to those views, that isn't how things actually work so what i am saying is the how things actually work is this mutual shaping of purposes context values methods and technology and that's what i'm calling entangled pedagogy so here technology is seen as multiple contextual and relational so what i mean is technology is never just one thing it's always multiple things so if you think about uh zoom here that what's involved is software a computer, a microphone, a camera, um, all sorts of other things going on. So any technology is always actually a bunch of technologies. And that makes it quite difficult to isolate particular properties. Um, it's always contextual in the sense that it's being used in a particular way at a particular time in a particular setting. Um, and that matters as to how we interpret technology and the influence that it can have and it's always relational in the sense that it doesn't act in isolation of a whole bunch of other things that are going on so agency here is never full for technology and never full for the educators it's always negotiated between elements including educators and technology and students and policy and infrastructure and the outcomes of any educational activity are really difficult to pin down because they're contingent on all of these complex relations going on and, and that's frustrating for various people who want to be able to guarantee outcomes or to measure uh, the efficacy of a particular technology or approach but uh, that as I see it that's very difficult to do because any outcome is always contingent on this complexity and I've said the skill involved for educators is in a whole bunch of things configuration of technology the design of the of the activities the orchestration and the different practices that people um, put into it over on the right i've added another column which i'm calling aspirational so i think this is very difficult to achieve at least all of the time but it can be held as a direction for us to move towards in order to try and act on the knowledge that we can get from the integral pedagogy view so aspirationally I think we can emphasize purposes and context and values over methods and technology. And we can um, collaborate, educators and students can collaborate in design and practice. And that's important because, as we've said, um, outcomes are emergent and uh, everything is relational. So if you can collaborate with teachers and between teachers and students, you have a little bit more sense of what the factors are involved in what's in whatever's going on. So when I say um, 
it's difficult to predict how well a session, a hybrid session is going to go because of the complexity, all of the different technologies involved, all of the different variables and the context and all of that complexity. If the educators and the students are on the same team and working together, it's much easier to make that go well because they can help each other. And that's different from the sort of consumerist idea of educators providing a service to students and students being satisfied or not satisfied by the service that the educators provide. It makes it much more difficult to manage these complex relations. If we can embrace, embrace uncertainty, embrace, that's a good word. Um, if we can embrace uncertainty, imperfection, openness and honesty, then we can be a little bit uh, it makes it easier for us to negotiate with each other how to act in any circumstance. If we need to try to pretend to be perfect, all-knowing, and entirely secure and certain about everything we do, then it closes down opportunities for expressing what's going on and what needs to change. So the knowledge that's involved in this kind of educational practice, I'm saying, is distributed, responsible, responsive, and ethical. So distributed in the sense that Teaching isn't done by the teachers, but it's done by the teachers and the students and the IT staff and the librarians and the administrators and the policymakers. And it's too complicated and complex for any one person to know everything that they need to know in order to do this well. So the knowledge is distributed across different types of stakeholders and it needs to be negotiated in order to be enacted. Knowledge is responsive in that it has to be able to attune to a particular situation and it needs to be able to react to what's going on that can't be predicted in advance. And knowledge should be ethical in the sense that we need to trace the relations of this complexity to see where they lead. So we don't, because outcomes are emergent, we don't know what the implications will be of introducing a new technology, for example. And the ethical knowledge involves actually finding that out and trying to see all of the different ways in which technology plays out in complex circumstances over time. So Chris, um, having gone through a fair bit of heavy stuff there, it might be worth just checking in with you to see if there are any questions that I can answer right now before I move on to the next bit, which will be a bit lighter, honestly. Thank you, Tim. So there, <clears throat> excuse me, are no questions in the Q&A, but this is a healthy reminder that if you do have a question, please include it using their utilizing the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll get to your questions at the end of this talk or we can jump right in. But yeah, no questions currently, Tim, but just a healthy reminder for attendees to ask any question you see fit. Thanks, Chris. I, was, I, I always I always mute myself and then I can never find the button again, um, but uh, I have found it. Um, yeah, so please do ask questions at the end, otherwise I'll feel really awkward. Um, it's, it's maybe time to move on to some of the more practical aspects of design and uh, of the the kind of, the focus will be hybrid, but I I try to always zoom out a bit and get less bogged down in these kinds of talks anyway, um, in the practicalities of how you can smoothly run a hybrid session and think more about how can we open up our thinking? How, do, how can I help you think about thinking that will allow you to see hybrid design or online or blended or on-campus design in the sort of way that I think is helpful um, going forward? And I can give you examples um, of why this is helpful, maybe at the end, in relation to some of the work that I've done for the Edinburgh Futures Institute. But anyway, for now, um, one of the things I really like oops, is to think about education as fundamentally asynchronous. I think we often get caught up in worrying about session plans, live classes, whether that's on campus, hybrid or online. Um, but actually, if you think about what students and learners do, they don't just come, hopefully, they don't just come to these sessions, but actually they engage with the course, the materials, the readings, the, 
the conversations with friends, thinking about stuff, doing activities all the way through the week. So they don't just learn at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. They learn from Monday to Sunday in various ways, some of which involve what you ask them to do and some of which involve incidental informal things or self-directed things or whatever and therefore i think education is asynchronous it spans across weeks and fortnights and months and full whole courses and years and these synchronous sessions that we obsess over they punctuate that asynchronous activity so rather than thinking of the content as being captured inside synchronous sessions I think of synchronous sessions as opportunities for clarification, motivation, bringing things together, making connections between stuff that's happening outside of these synchronous events. Um, so when we're designing things, we can look beyond single session plans. We can look beyond the content that we've decided is important for the students. And we can think about how we can help them fit all of the different things they learn when we're not there um together how they can make connections and how they can keep learning when we're not there taking advantage of all of the opportunities they have and when you think about hybrid or blended learning or online learning that's I, that's really important but i'll get back to that in a second so here's just the reinforcement of that idea that you have different students experiencing different things outside of class then the circle is this sort of punctuation where you bring them all together and, and you punctuate that wider journey. And then they go off and do different things. And some, some of that they'll do together and some of that they'll do individually. And there is an ethical question around the extent to which you should get directly involved in the stuff that is outside of those events. You can set tasks for them to do and things, but actually it's totally appropriate for students to go off and do some stuff that you didn't ask them to do but that doesn't mean that it's irrelevant because you can still talk to them about what they do and you can still guide them in the sorts of things they might do and you can use your synchronous planning and your activity planning to build in that learning how to learn or, or thinking reflecting on the ways that they learn and developing working practices that work for them and so looking across longer timescales, you have these pre-events, you've got the design events, you've got post-event, and you have all of these undesigned tasks and arrangements. And all I want to do by banging on about this is to suggest that all of that is important, which isn't to say you need to directly mess with it, but you might want to think about how you can support those pre- and post-event things to be more effective. And this brings me to the idea of the post-digital, um, which I'm going to characterize here just by saying online learning isn't really online and on-campus education is partly online. So the learning in online learning isn't online. It's just learning. The communication might be online and the that you might use some sort of online space like a virtual learning environment, but learning is just learning. And what you might want to do in online learning is to build a staircase out from a, an online course, a virtual space out into the world, even though I also want to say that a virtual learning environment is in the world. But you might want to you might want to build a staircase out of that space with some tasks, go off and explore uh, the city or the countryside around you, um, go and do something that doesn't involve you having to be in this virtual space connect with uh, fellow students and people and then come back into the course and talk about what you learned so online learning doesn't have to all be inside this virtual space um, and, and you want to make connections out of it but the same is true for a classroom on campus you want to build staircases out of the classroom into online spaces and outdoor spaces and all sorts of spaces and then sometimes bring them back into the classroom for discussion and workshopping. So just trying to break the bounds that we set up around classrooms and virtual spaces um, and thinking again that education is both asynchronous and um, expansive. It doesn't 
need to be bounded in the ways that we often end up bounding it. So again, this kind of diagram where students come into virtual or on virtual or physical classrooms, but actually they're doing a whole bunch of stuff outside of those classrooms all the time. And all events are situated and emergent and social and material and digital. So digital stuff is going on outside of a virtual space because people are connected in various ways, or even the fact that they know that they could look something up out after class changes the way they interact during class. So this separation constantly of what's digital and what's not digital, I think is a bit unhelpful because actually in anything that we consider digital, it's always embodied in social and material and anything that we consider non-digital always has this reciprocal shaping of digital actualities and possibilities going on. So coming back to the ways in which we adopt new technology, it's important to think of technology as multiple contextual and relational. So if we think, oh, we've brought in a new technology, what we sometimes forget is that there are other technologies already there that, that we need to work with in combination, or that students have their own technologies going on outside of our spaces and that they've developed ways of using those technologies that work for them in a lot of cases. So we might need to think about how to support them to make use of these different combinations and to talk and just to talk to them about it. Again, I've, I've said before that there's a lot of knowledge required in all this, and it's a bit ambitious to ask any one person to know everything. So actually talking to students and talking to IT staff and talking to instructional designers and a lot of different stakeholders is quite helpful and being open to the to the fact that you don't know everything is is conducive to these kinds of negotiations and this will all help us look at what are the potential benefits of adopting new technology what are the potential and actual harms and risks what can we do what is actually being done what are students actually doing and what might they do and this gives us more material to work with so all of this suggests this emergent kind of education where outcomes can never be fully preset before. We have learning outcomes a lot of the time, but actually there are a lot of different types of outcomes and some of them need to be negotiated on the fly, especially in something as complicated as hybrid. So in the Edinburgh Futures Institute, where I teach on a course called Post-Digital Society, we have fusion uh, hybrid workshops and what I try to do is I try to lower the stakes of those workshops because we never know how far we will get. You don't know how tired students will be or if something will be interrupted or if some technology won't work or if there's just something that we dig into more deeply than we had anticipated. So lowering the stakes of what the outcomes need to be, again, by thinking across the whole course and thinking, okay, if we get less done during that time, then how can we continue to do it after the fact rather than saying we need to capture thing B during that session and thing C afterwards. It's more like A, B and C are done across the course. And how can we shift things around to be responsive to how far we get during any given activity? Again, this is just reinstating the idea that involving other people in all these things and articulating purposes, values, and context and negotiating things with them on as we go can be really important and helpful because often we will end up in cross purposes and with tensions going on, and that can be really unhelpful. So trying to open up the space for this collaborative working together can be really important. Again, I'm talking aspirationally because I know that this is really difficult to do in a lot of situations and, and not everyone will be on board with this view. But I think if we hold this as the direction that we try to move towards, then that gives us something um, to aim for. Entanglement is not just in the moment, it's also over time. So Design, I want to say, starts a lot earlier than any particular synchronous event. It starts with, it might start with advocating for better resources and infrastructure and more teaching staff and different policies. 
So design isn't really independent of all these background background work that we uh, that we need to do. And it's entangled with evaluation and it's entangled with the procurement of new technologies, of ethics. It's entangled in policymaking. And so sometimes we need to work on all of that background stuff or we need to collaborate with people who are in a better position to do that than we are. I don't, some of you may have seen an online teaching iceberg before from me on Twitter, but um, I've changed it to be the, the hybrid teaching iceberg for uh, today's purposes. It's exactly the same. So <laughs> I've changed the word online to hybrid because I think it basically applies uh, in the same way. Um, you've got a hybrid class or an online class or a classroom class above the water, and that's what people see. And they think that's the crux of teaching. But under the surface, there's a whole lot of things that need to happen to make that work. And I say that recognition of those activities as legitimate part of teaching often decreases the further down you get. So maybe people will recognize that preparing materials is an important aspect um, of teaching and they might see design tasks, but then maybe they start to forget that evaluating, developing or having conversations and longitudinal community building are, are important. And all the way down to advocating for resources and changes to infrastructure and policy, which are kind of legitimate educational activities to try and improve that class and other classes. Um, and again, if we aren't supported to engage in those kind of activities, we'll be limited in the extent to which we can make the kind of improvements that I've been talking about. Um, in all this, what does it mean for the development of educators? Now, I've got a whole list of things there. Knowledge is distributed and it's collaborative, open, value-laden, purposeful, seamful, responsive, ethical. So a lot. There's a lot to learn about. And it's very challenging and demanding. So as I've said, we need help, right? We need we need people to work together for this to, to, to happen. Um, I've got the word seamful in there, and that might not be obvious to some people. So I'll just quickly explain what I mean. So seamlessness is the idea. Seamless education uh, allows people to transition from a novice to an expert or not a state of not knowing to a state of knowing. And um, it's quite clear cut. You you go in one end, you come in one end and you go out the other and you're an expert or a master or a graduate. However, it doesn't always work like that. And so I've got a little, uh, I'm picking on constructive alignment, but I could be picking on a whole bunch of different things. Um, the idea that you can set up some learning outcomes, some aims, some purposes, and then as long as you follow a particular kind of formula, that will happen. But actually, there's an assumption that learning outcomes are right, that we've set the right learning outcomes, and that those learning outcomes do adequately capture the purposes that are important. And yet purposes are always multiple and there are individual purposes and collective purposes. They need to be negotiated to an extent where, as you go and they're mutually shaped by a whole bunch of things that can't be identified in advance. And there's sometimes an assumption that we, the designers, can constructively align a course for our students. But actually, the whole point of constructive alignment is that they need to be actively involved in that and so you can't do it for them and it has to be this collaborative activity which means you can't guarantee that it will happen in advance so a seamful approach is where you can actually see how education is supposed to happen and you can modify it you can see the working parts so if you think about like an an iphone for example it's seamless in that you can't understand you can't access the workings, you can't change them, you can't get under the hood to mix metaphors. Um, whereas a seamful approach says, this is how we're doing this. And that this comes back to the articulation of rationales for why you've designed something the way that you have and how you want students to help you complete your designs. And then this again speaks to the need to be open and honest, because if you are letting them under the hood of your educational designs, then you're showing that you're not perfect and, and you're allowing them to directly engage with your imperfections. So uh, an acknowledgement of imperfection in design and execution 
and an embracement of openness and honesty, it all helps you get towards this seamful design of education. And just a little thank you to Lena marcus Geiter and Lucila Carvalho. We're working on a paper to do with imperfect design, but our own imperfections have led to us not yet finishing that paper, but we will. So getting close to the end of the slides and we can go into Q&A. Um, I see there are five questions, so that's exciting. Basically, um, instead of always evaluating things at the end of a course, and always focusing on student satisfaction and perceptions. I think in order to embrace this kind of complexity, we need a living evaluation where we evaluate as we go. We continually talk about what's working for who in what circumstances and why and what can we do about it and be prepared to adjust things as we go while acknowledging the imperfections of our conditions and ourselves. We won't be able to fix everything um, but we can find out and we can be honest about how it's going and we can use that as a basis for uh, for change. So uh, a list of some references, but I'm assuming that um, I can send out the slides to the participants or that there'll be a way of accessing this um, rather than reading that out. So I shall move on to the title slide, which is the, sig the sign that I'm finished talking at you and I can start um, engaging with your questions. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Tim. This was great. There are a few questions in the Q&A, which is great. If it's okay, I'm going to actually combine two of these questions. Uh, so one question is from Jessica Patterson, which is, I'm interested in if you think emergent outcomes can coexist in an outcomes-based model, which is the current curriculum approach in most Ontario colleges. I'm going to add or mention the second question from uh, Alyssa Arnold, which is, measurable outcomes are currently a key part of Canada's education system, grades, employability. So what are your thoughts about how to engage stakeholders to consider a broader understanding mm -hmm. of education? So thank you, um, Jessica and Alyssa. Uh, those are really good questions. And I was um, mindful of this context coming here. And actually, we have similar things going on in the United Kingdom and in Australia, where I'll move to. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that emergent outcomes will always, in my mind, inevitably exist in an outcomes-based model. It doesn't mean you have to throw out the outcomes-based model but I think you have to acknowledge that there are more things going on than can be captured in any particular framework, um, outcomes-based framework. And I like the concept of fudging, um, where you have rules or a system. I don't know if you can hear my child sneezing outside my door. Um, we have rules and systems and um, guidelines and things and those are important in giving structure but they only work in reality because people have a little bit of leeway to fudge things so that they they work for the context that they're in so if you think about like um i don't know think about a policing system where there is a strict law but actually in some cases a very difficult to adhere to the letter of that law, you need somebody to be able to use a bit of discretion so that dire consequences don't happen to people that don't deserve it, for example. And then there is a balance to that because you don't want that to go too far. And I think in outcomes-based education, I mean, I know because I supervise a PhD student who's looking at the, this and we have lots of conversations in the medical school um, here about the fact that you can have these strict criteria, regulations, accreditation, outcomes-based systems, but that there's always a little bit of adjustment that goes on in order to make them work. But, but also, I think just this acceptance that there will be other messy things that people learn that aren't captured by. I mean, we all know that, right? So I guess it's not throwing out the outcomes-based system, using that as a structural entity, but then also having these conversations on the side about what else is going on. I really appreciate that response. Thank you. 
I'm going to move on to another question from one of our own at eCampus, Monica Shaw. How do you assess the time and duration required for punctuating and designing events and like making it personalized, making it a personalized experience for students? Um, well, I think design is often quite pragmatic, isn't it? Um, so we have stipulated, sometimes we have stipulated contact hours, which isn't a term I like, but, you know, sometimes you have that. Um, sometimes you have an amount of time that you think students are able to dedicate to um, meeting synchronously, and that depends on what level and discipline and, and things they're in. And so in a way, what I would do is I would take the time that we have, because I, I, I think synchronous events can be very, very valuable, but take the time that we have to do something that is helpful in this broader sense across the week. Um, so I can talk from experience on, we, I run an online masters in clinical education with colleagues and our students are um, professionals, healthcare professionals, and they, they study part-time and what they need really is a way of coming together and talking about the stuff that is important to them at the time and how to connect it to the asynchronous activities that they do that help them towards their assignments but also that they can put into practice and it's i guess it's responsive so everything i've said is really you need to take the context into account so i couldn't give you a blanket um, amount of time i would say you have to think about what are you trying to achieve? What is the context of the students? What do I think is important in relation to education? So in the postgraduate healthcare education sense, one of the things that's important to us is dialogue and students being able to drive the conversation towards what interests them, but that won't be true for all contexts. So most of my questions are, it depends, which is probably quite frustrating for people who just want a clear answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, seeing some more questions from anonymous attendees uh, from the top here. So I really appreciate this languaging. I'm wondering if you have ever received pushback from teachers and faculty or used to the one way sort of modality of instruction, Tim. I think, thank you. I think the pushback often comes in terms of, well, I'm really busy and um, how do I actually do any of this? Which is a totally fair question. Um, and that always leads me back to the importance of holding this as aspirational rather than actual, because I think if you've got something as an aspiration, if you struggle to manage it at any given point of time, you don't have to give up because you you always knew that it was just the, the direction you were trying to move towards. Um, the other thing is that you they always need help. Um, so the trying to achieve all of these types of things by yourself and as an, as an individual is probably not possible so I, to me what my hope is that it just suggests things that they might try to do to move in this direction that they might that you might not think of otherwise such as collaborating more with people talking more with people that you otherwise wouldn't talk to and that sort of thing but the pushback that i get is usually entirely fair it's really hard And literally only imagine, actually. Um, pulling another question here. So in your experience, Tim, have you noticed any emerging ways that educators can guide students outside of the classroom learning, perhaps like recommending documentaries, games, etc.? cetera? Uh, so I have, um, a, I have a colleague called Sharon Boyd um, at the University of Edinburgh who's talk, written about place-based learning um, on, in an online context. So people going out into their communities, researching the land um, and bringing that research back to the online community for discussion, um, online field trips and things. Um, so I know we, we have a sort of hybrid context here, but in some ways what you need to do is 
think of it think of the online students in a hybrid context as being real embodied people with an you know real physical environment that they can go out and explore and so can the classroom based students and and so and being interested in what all of them have to say about their local environment for example i i'm hoping that answers the question which has disappeared so i <laughs> i'm hoping that was an answer to that question thank you that's totally my fault for disappearing that question i guess i kind of have a, a little bit of a follow-up question if, if i may um and so I, I really liked your reminder at the beginning of the talk and i guess thematically throughout your talk that like there are many co-creators or cooks in the kitchen so to speak that are involved with designing a quality teaching and learning experience and I guess a sort of silly analogy that comes to mind is around like actors and making movies and I mean as a kid I revered actors the actors in my mind were I would always get the credit I guess behind movies but the more I learned about how movies or like movie production the the more I realized like there, there are so many considerations and aspects that goes into producing a movie, right? And I guess the more I came to appreciate the experience of watching a movie, the better the experience was, arguably speaking, and sort of that collective of like feeling like you're a part of something. And I guess if my assumption is correct, that that appreciation can deepen learning in sort of the analogy of using teachers as kind of like the main focus or spotlights, like, how can other educators sort of share that experience or, or share that, you know, collective uh, work that goes into producing a quality, you know, experience for, for students? Like, I just wonder, like, is there a way that other educators can sort of share that experience of like, that there are many different players that are involved in designing an educational experience? Well, I, I really like that question. And I think if, if, collaboration genuinely happens then then that will sort of take care of itself because the other stakeholders will know a lot more about what's going on in that educational process and they'll feel like they're part of it and hopefully the teachers will not just acknowledge them but kind of invite them into the bit um i don't, I don't know what it's like where you are but often teachers teach to students and nobody watches them and if if you suggest that they might have a peer observe their teaching then people get defensive because there's this kind of weird accountability culture of ratings and and all those things act against what i'm advocating which is actually that it's just all open everyone can see and everyone can comment and it's not the blame you know the, the credit and the blame the responsibility are all distributed including to students um so that it isn't all on one person so actually just breaking the culture that we have is a really important aspect of inviting other people into the room to be part of that educational process thank you for entertaining that question tim I am being mindful of the time. I want to apologize to some of the attendees for not getting to your questions in the Q&A, but I think it's a good time to wrap up. So that sort of concludes today's webinar. And I want to thank you, Dr. Fons, Tim, for, for giving or joining us today from all the way from Scotland and providing this talk to uh, make up our series or our webinar series before for TESS. Um, so thank you very much for your insights here today. And, and thank you all to our audience as well. We hope you enjoyed today's session and want to hope, hope you want to join us for another webinar session actually tomorrow at noon. But I um, also want to thank the eCampus Ontario team or the behind the scenes team for making today's webinar possible and handling all the behind the scenes arrangements. Um, but mostly thank you, Tim, for joining us today. Thanks very much, Chris and everyone. I, I loved it. I hope you did. And um, I've made a little copy of the Q and A's and chat in case I can carve out some time to actually answer those. And I'll send them via uh, Latvia or Jason or Chris or whoever, um, and hope that they make it out to you. But yeah, thank you for listening. I also want to remind everyone you can join the Slack channel to keep the conversation going here as well. And if you have any trouble trouble trying to access the PowerPoints or whatnot, I'm sure you can reach out to Latvia and she will share this information with you. But once again, Tim, thank you very much for joining us today. Um,
really appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone.